topics and opinions expressed on the following show are solely those of the host and their guests and not those of W4CS Radio, its employees, or affiliates. W4CS makes no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for listening to the Cancer Support Network on W4CS.com. with light up your life and um, we're already into the second week of September and I hope if you're tuning in later or if you're tuning in today that um, that you are well uh, of course we always start with my little spiel of knowing that it's difficult times and to make sure that you are taking care of yourself however that looks um, I know that for so many rest and reprieve is so hard uh, many of my clients, of course, are reporting very difficult times and going to sleep and just being tired. And the weight of the world is really, I think, on everyone's shoulders. Um, so just a friendly reminder to take some time in the evenings. If, if you can just put down your devices and put them away, just like we always recommend to our children. And, uh, you know, they say that uh, the light, the infra light and all the that it does to our systems really does affect our mind, body, and spirit. So if you can put them away before you go to bed, even just a half an hour before, and um, I have talked to um, many of you about binaural beats, which are really great for children with ADHD, but also for all of us. Actually, this morning I was listening to it as my morning playlist, and it was really helpful just to provide some grounding. And... Um, yeah, just make sure that you're using music and simple, simple things to take care of yourself and really also um, taking a break from the device and the TV and um, trying to center as much as we can. Um, today, I'm really excited about our conversation with a great parenting expert. And um, as many of you know, this, this forum is for health and wellness and everything in between. And parenting wellness is so important and many of us carry that hat. Um, and of course, when you decide that you become a parent, whether it be a surprise or not, the role is forever. And for those of you who may not even be raising children in this stage, you might actually have grandchildren or godchildren and children in your community. So today's topic and our presenter really, um, really speaks volumes to effective discipline and also all of his experience and everything that he brings. So Dr. Phelan is a well-renowned clinical psychologist who has over 35 years of experience in helping parents really develop effective, um, effective skills. I first uh, was introduced to Dr. Phelan's work about 15, 12, it was 12 years ago when I first got into um, clinical counseling and it was through my internship um, at a family child counseling center that I was exposed to this awesome program. And so what today's focus is on how to be providing effective discipline while being a happy parent, while still making sure that you are respected as a parent, your child is connected with you and how um, that can be. Dr. Phelan's many experiences in his program, One, Two, Three, Magic, and many, many books that he has written that I'm so excited to actually uh, go into with him is the conversation today. And so with further ado, I, well, no, I'm sorry. Without further ado, I, I, um, I am so happy to have him on today. Welcome. Hello, Artie. How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing pretty well, pretty well. Dr. Phelan, thank you for coming on in this month of September because it is a huge transition time and I I couldn't have asked for a more perfect time for you to be on our show and really, um, really expose our parents and our families to a really great system and your philosophy of how you view things. 
well, September, August and September, all the kids going back to school and they really are going back to school this year. I think most of them, but uh, certainly stimulates a, a good deal of anxiety with the uh, COVID risks that are out there and just a general feeling of uncertainty. I mean, we all have enough uncertainty in our lives, but this is like a extra dose for the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally. Dr. Phelan, can you go to the beginning chapters of your um, of your life and share how did you just a little bit about your childhood, your upbringing and kind of what unfolded the story of being so passionate about parenting and your clinical work? Yeah, well, I grew up um, and of course I was a, being a kid. I didn't know anything about parenting and um, I grew up and you know had a fairly uh, pleasant, I think, uneventful childhood. And, you know, people ask me, you know, what did you think of before you had kids? I can honestly say I, I'm, I think I'm like a lot of people, probably a lot of guys. I didn't think about having kids. It's just like, well, that's something you do when the time comes. But mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't dream about it. I didn't fear it. I didn't do anything. I just, well, the time comes. Now, now we have kids and, and here they are. What do we do now? Uh, and I think that's the experience that a lot of that a lot of uh, people have. I think I think moms and um, women think about it more and dream about it more than than us guys do. So I think we kind of get caught uh, caught unawares in some ways. That's so true. That's so true. So many women and moms that I have spoken to, or in my friend circle, like we do, we do have this dream phase for years of our lives. I mean, since we play and. Since we play dolls, it's like a dream to have a family and to have children. You're absolutely right. You're yeah. 100%. Well, I think one of the things also that I think affects both women and men is, and I hope I don't irritate anybody, but I believe that in our society, we have very unrealistic uh, and excessively romantic ideas about both marriage and children. And the unfortunate part of this is it's a setup uh, because the, the dreams are almost always, I call them heaven fantasies. Heaven mm -hmm. fantasies, I think about the positive, you know, the smiling child sitting on my lap. I'm reading her a story before bed. We're going out there for ice cream or donuts or whatever uh, kind of thing. And, uh, <clears throat> and with marriage, too, we have a lot of positive fantasies about it. And the reality, like the reality of anything in life, is it's it's good and bad it's it's mm -hmm. mixed but we are not prepared for the mixed part of it uh and i think what that leads us into is you know we've got a divorce rate around 50 percent. i think the unrealistic expectations were part of that i think the unrealistic ex expectations about raising children we, we we don't in our dreams we don't think about arguing yelling whining fighting screaming sibling rivalry temper tantrums they won't go to bed they wake up in the middle of the night and that's kind of what one, two, three magic is all about. Let's, let's accept and normalize these things, but let's come up with strategies for dealing with them that are effective, which are not simply yelling, go to bed. Mm -hmm. That's basically mm -hmm. what we do. We default to reasoning, stop teasing your sister, go to bed, do all that kind of stuff. And it, it doesn't work. You're absolutely right. And I'm really glad you brought this up because, um, our societal um, expectations have really, I feel corrupt. I 100% agree with you because what's happened is you bring up the half and half rate. If you look for divorce and and just children in general, it is the fact that we have had these expectations that are totally unmatched of what reality is. So I really love the fact that you brought that up. Why I love your program so much is it's really simple. So can you share a just a few strategies or things that you think are important for families to know when you think of simplicity when it comes to giving di discipline. Sure, and let me say something about simplicity too that you mentioned, because I think that's important. I got out of graduate school as a clinical psychologist and I learned the hard way about simplicity. Uh, I started doing parenting groups and we do um, you know, homework. So between now and next week, this is what we want you to do. Uh, and so on. And people come back the next week saying, how'd you do with the homework? And they look at me with this sort of blank stare <laughs> on their face. And as it turned out, the, the homework was, uh, it was too complex. Mm -hmm. It was too difficult. <clears throat> and what I learned the hard way was that if you don't keep it simple, nobody will do it. 
And that applies to anybody in the field of mental health. It applies to so many things in, in life. And so I'll give you, I'll just give you a quick rundown on the, uh, the one, two, three magic. You have three parenting jobs, okay? three parenting jobs. You do these three jobs, you'll be a pretty good parent. And I'm not going to talk about emotional intelligence. I'm not talking about the two sides of the brain and integrating them. I'm talking about three parenting jobs. The first one has to do with obnoxious behavior. Okay? Arguing, yelling, whining, fighting, screaming, teasing, tantruming, obnoxious behavior. For that, we have one primary tactic, which is called signaling. And the version we use is counting. There are a lot of different signals that you can use with the kids. But instead of yelling or saying, stop whining, we use a signal that indicates to the child they're doing something out of line, they better figure out what it is, and they better stop it. And it works very effectively. So the parenting job number one, obnoxious behavior, signaling. Parenting job number two, positive behavior, getting up and out in the morning, eating. Uh, uh, getting uh, you know, your stuff ready for school, uh, doing your homework, going to bed. Uh, what's more important than going to bed? Staying in bed uh, is very important. That's all positive behavior, sharing, being kind to people. For positive behaviors, we have tactics we call routines. You want to set up routines for these things. Everything, everything on that list, you want a routine for it. You don't just say, eat your beets. Uh, or eat your broccoli. You have a routine for uh, uh, eating as well as these other things. So obnoxious behavior, signaling, positive behavior, routines. And then the third parenting job uh, is bonding with your kids or strengthening your relationship. And we have tactics there. And you do the first two jobs well, you'll automatically bond tons with your kids because the good thing about mother nature is she built into us parents and kids uh, automatic tendency to love one another and like one another. But that tendency can get messed up when obnoxious behavior or not doing positive things gets you know, uh, in, in the way. But there are other things you can do that help you bond with your kids. And my two favorites are um, active listening, or I call it sympathetic listening. I mean, kid comes home from school and says, my music teacher is an idiot. You don't say, that's disrespectful, stop talking like that. You listen, you say, what happened? You sound upset. And the other thing, my super duper favorite bonding tactic is shared one-on-one -on -one fun. Uh, one child and one parent sharing the same thing at the same time. Notice I did not say whole family fun. Whole family fun is one of these romantic myths uh, that tends to get in the way and cause a lot of trouble in our society. So one-on-one uh, -on -one fun with the kids is a great way to bond. So Overall parenting, keep it simple. What does that mean? Three parenting jobs, obnoxious behavior, good behavior, and bonding. Do those three things, you'll be a pretty good parent. That's amazing. I love, like I said, the simplicity of it all is, you're right. It's just like a fad diet diet. Anything to follow through on, people are not going to do. I mean, I'm, I, we're all human. None of us do anything that's complex. We'll start off really strong, but then we don't follow through. And yeah. that's the thing about parenting. The follow through is such a huge component, right? That I'm sure you've seen, in, and I've seen it with my own parents that I've worked with, and myself included. When we don't follow through, then that's when it's all it's all basically gone, right? They have to restart, restart, restart. Yeah, yeah. and I think one of the nice things about the one, two, three, <clears throat> especially with accounting, but with the other stuff too, is you do it right. It's self reinforcing, so it helps you with the follow through. Uh, so it's like, this feels good. This feels good. I'm in control. I'm liking my children. Uh, and this is the kind of family that I want to have. So it helps you to continue with it as opposed to dieting where I don't eat the piece of pie. This feels bad. It's good mm -hmm. for me, but I wanted that piece of pie. It's a little different. Yes. So I actually want to highlight something you said. You said, because you said it's a myth and I follow that myth to about whole family fun because it's, been projected for so long. So what would you tell for our families who are saying, well, how do I create time one-on-one -on -one in my busy, my busy schedule? Or how, what would you suggest to them? Yeah, you can look at it. First of all, it doesn't have to be, you know, you know a, a two week trip to Bermuda. Uh, <clears throat> you can do 15 minutes a day. You can read them a story before bed. You can go for a walk. You can take one child shopping. Uh, it's certainly a benefit if you have 
you know, two parents and two kids, which is like a typical family. Uh, but you take the one child out. And what you do, you, you, you think about it. Think about why one-on-one -on -one fun is so much better than whole family fun. And there are two reasons. Number one, every parent knows, if you reflect on it, that kids cherish one-on-one -on -one time with the parent. They, they love it. They blossom. They flower. They open up. They're easy to manage. You don't have the problems that you have. And second thing is, what's the main problem you have when you have the kids together? Is sibling rivalry. There's a statistic that kids age three to seven will fight on the average three to four times per hour. <clears throat> so you want to go on a family vacation and you're awake for 16 hours a day times four. <laughs> yeah. Look at the number. These numbers aren't good. <laughs> so you think think of those and then think of what kind of experience you have when you have the child uh, alone. And that'll help motivate you. I've told parents, do do my, my, my McDonald's experiment. Next time you go to McDonald's, if you can eat indoors, sit down and eat as a family at the same table. Then the next time you go after that, uh, take one parent, one child, they go sit over here, another parent, another child, they go sit over here. And then you come back and tell me which time you enjoyed more. And that'll motivate you too. I love that you're using experiential examples because that experience speaks volumes, right? When you have to try things out. It does. It does. Mm, so true. I will tell you, I am taking everything in. And one of the things truly for me is I realize my children, my, my older daughter, which oftentimes when I even deal with my clients, they, the, the, it seems like the dynamic is usually that the second child is the one who somehow gets all the attention, right? Because of the behaviors, they're a little bit more overt. So that first child is always craving and wanting that that individual attention. And somehow, while we're talking, I realize you're you're absolutely one hundred percent right. Where if you could give that individual time, how that builds up that connectivity, and then also is very empowering for the family because they're obviously asking for it. They are. You know, it's interesting what to say about the first one, because if you look at all the kids in your family, <clears throat> which one of them is the only one that ever, ever, ever had the experience of being the, the only one in the household and the one who gets all the attention? It's the first one. And then they lost it. It's like Milton's Paradise Lost. They, they, they fell out of there. They lost it. All the other ones started out with somebody extra, so they're a little more used to it. Mm -hmm. But the first one has to go through that... Uh, uh, you, you know, enjoyment of it, and then they, they don't know how good they had it in a sense, and then they lose it. And I think that's part of the dynamic that you're talking about. Yes, yes. So as we know, family of origin and family um, higher, it all matters in terms of siblings. But I I do think you're, that sibling rivalry plays such a big role for so many families. So, so having that individual time that you're talking about and starting to build that up, and I love, and you're saying it doesn't have to be anything complicated. It could just be the reading of the story or taking a walk or going yeah. shopping. Uh, could be training your kids to cook, training them to do the laundry. Now, yeah. Another thing that comes up with that is oftentimes the child who's not going along at that particular time, like if you're going shopping, may squawk about it <clears throat> or may, you know, pout or do, you know, whatever uh, and so on. And so parents have to be ready to handle that. Uh, mm -hmm. when that come that time comes and you can say to them you know your time will be this or that or the other thing that doesn't always help so you have to be ready with something like signaling or counting uh, to deal with the uh, testing and manipulation you get from the one who's not included at that particular moment dr phil real quick can you give us an example let's say a child let's say they were having a meltdown at the store right it's yeah. a four-year-old. Can you can you give us an example of what how how we could use one two three magic in that moment? Yes, you can do so. If you have a, a risk of a meltdown at the store, uh, you might first of all think about what's going to cause it. Is a good child going to want candy or something like that? And is there some way I can prevent that? And so what some people do is just give them something to eat before you get into the store. But let's say aisle five is the candy aisle, and you're in that aisle and. Uh, the child says, "Can I have some candy?" You say, "No," and boom, they blow up. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, don't 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 you love this? You know, kids screaming and yelling. You're feeling upset, and a crowd is gathering to see how you're going to handle it uh, to make the thing even more fun for you. So there you are, 
what's the first thing you can do? First thing you do with tantrums, you can count them. You can say that's one, okay? Uh, <clears throat> with And so use our signaling thing. If the child hits a three, now I'm not going into all the details of counting mm -hmm. right now, uh, but then there's going to be a uh, rest period or break time or timeout. And you can do that in the corner of the store. You can do it in the washroom. You can Some parents take the child back to the um, uh, car uh, for the break time, and they do that. But one of the things you can't do, which you naturally want to do very, very much at that time, is talk to the child. Okay, you say, come on, honey. Now, now don't do this in front of me. You're, you're embarrassing mommy in front of everybody else and blah, blah, blah. You do that, it's like pouring gasoline on a fire. And you know it. And any parent who's done that, if you reflect on it, you know that that will make the kid worse because they sense your vulnerability. Mm -hmm. They sense the fact that they may get what they want if they keep this up and they drive you really, really batty. Maybe they will get the candy bar. And even if they don't get the candy bar, they're going to get revenge because you were such a mean parent that you didn't give them the candy bar. <laughs> No. This is all true. We have all been through this, so it's legitimate. This this scenario is all. <laughs> it yeah. is, you know, and I've told parents too, and I think it's really true. Who, who's more important right now, your child or the people who you think are watching? And it's mm -hmm. it's your child. It's more important that you do the correct thing uh, than than put on a good show for the you know these uh, other people. Uh, and and that's what you have to do. Make up your mind. The threat of public embarrassment. Yes, it's horrible. It feels really bad. But my kid's more important. That's a great, that is such a great statement because you're right. We, we do, we commercialize and make it about everybody else. And in that moment it is, it's still always about our children and we, we forget, right? We're like, oh my, I, I did it a few weeks ago. I was like, oh my gosh, we're in public right now. Like, what are we, right? And I was, yeah. and, and, and it happens to the best of us in those moments. And you had, and then I was like, wait a minute, why am I reacting to what I, I don't even really care about anybody else at this point in my life, but I did. I made it about them versus my child. And and that's exactly right. Like when we talk about relationship with our children, and I know you say this, it is not just about our, our four walls. What does it look like in those social spaces? What does it look like in these other arenas? Yes, totally. Yeah, it's one of the, that the tantrum in public is, uh, I think, one of the most supreme tests of your parenting awareness and skill and you call it whatever whatever you want but it's a it's a pretty horrible experience while you're going through it's funny afterwards it's not funny at the time <laughs> Stop. you really have to be ready for it yes you know dr phil oprah says that it's parenting's the hardest job right i mean it's not that it's necessary it's just that we've never well been equipped with skills it is a skill i'm realizing more and more so right we have to look at what is what are some of the triggers that my child might have? It is a job. You 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 have to educate yourself about it. You have to train yourself. You have to go through reflection. And I think the minute that we start to mobilize a community and understand that it is a a job that is a beautiful job, it is a job, and it requires some work on our parts. And it is not going to go on automatic. No, it's not. And uh, interesting you bring that up because if you really think about it. You look at some other things, you know, to get a driver's license, you have to have, you know, 60, 30, 60 classroom hours and then, you know, behind the wheel uh, and you have to get a license to be a, a doctor. You have to have an MD, then do a residency uh, to be uh, working in a business. You might get an MBA and you get a lot of courses in personnel management. How many training hours do we do for parents? How many training hours do parents get? Zero, zero, big zero. Uh, and that is... I, you know, I hate to say it may sound crazy, but it's almost criminal uh, to, you wouldn't put somebody out in the, in the street behind a, in the, the wheel of a car with no training, but what do we do for parents? That's just what society does. And that is really, really crazy. And, you know, just makes for a lot of misery. And you're a hundred percent, right? Cause like back to how we are starting to look at health, cause this is actually a health crisis when we don't look at preventative measures with our parents because what does it look like when i myself don't handle myself as a parent internally well i explode it literally changes the way that that child and I, our relationship it changes the dynamics of the relationship if you are married or if you have a if you have a significant other and 
everything starts in these four walls to again engage into our community in terms of 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 the output that we're having and the people that we're raising yeah i think so and you know i'll, I'll say it bluntly but kids are one of the biggest causes of divorce now that sounds terrible but we have we have data showing that as soon as a couple moves in together or gets married uh, their relationship stat satisfaction starts to drop. And once you add kids to the mix, the speed of that decline doubles. So when you add, and so the, the thought, what's one of our myths? One of our myths is we'll have this cute little baby and it'll draw us closer together. Nothing could be farther from the truth. You have that cute little baby, it also screams and gets up in the middle of the night and it's gonna push you farther apart. And it's about time we recognize that and prepared people for it. Uh, but we don't do a good job of that. Um, but another cause, so, so kids are one of the causes of divorce. One of the other things related to what you were just saying is children are also a cause and behavior problems and lack of parent training is a cause of, especially in moms, maternal depression. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very depressing to have an out of control kid at home. You don't know what to do with. It's bad for your marriage. It's bad for you. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Thank you for bringing that up, especially about moms. I was actually going to get into this topic with you because you have a book called Managing um, the Mom Epidemic. And I can't, Managing Mom Epidemic. And we'll get into that in a minute because I just, A, I love that title. And B, that you have even addressed that mom role and what that means, especially in today's society where the expectations internal and external have been placed in a whole new world, in a whole new light. My question to you actually lies, What, where do you feel that, back to this depression model from moms, where do you feel like this pressure is coming from, for mothers to feel like they need to know how to discipline their children, to feel like they need to know, where is that coming from? And again, if you want to even just get into this book that you have created in this, um, you can totally move into that if you prefer to. Sure. Well, I think, <clears throat> you know, the, one of the questions is, okay, why not? paternal depression. How come we're talking about maternal depression? And one of the reasons there, because both moms and dads share the training gap. Uh, you, you look at that. But the, and I think this is both genetic as well as cultural. Moms still are seen as more responsible for primary child care, for training the kids. And that's from the moms and the dads. Dads and moms both look at it that way, that it's more mom's job than dad's job. And so that's why moms feel more of the pressure. And then the second thing is they don't have the training to do it. They, they'll read more books than the dads will do. Uh, but then when things don't go well, there's some very interesting studies. Uh, 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 there's a book by Gerald Patterson from a long time ago called uh, Mother's Unacknowledged Victims. And they look at moms trying to manage preschoolers. And he looked at the number of requests that mothers made of their kids during the course of the day of preschoolers and the volumes of requests and how many of those were not obeyed or listened to and it's about 60 percent uh, so the moms are confronted with these little kids who are just they're little little wild men and women you know because they're, they're preschoolers uh, and so you're trying to get them to do stuff and they're not cooperating that's a bummer that's depressing <clears throat> and so, but even now, what's happening now is that the moms are working outside the home. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in most, when you have a mom and a dad working uh, nowadays, 50% uh, of the time, both of them are working full time. Um, but when they come home, the expectations for who's going to do the primary child care and the household activities, guess who? Guess who? It's still moms. It's the, the load is still on the moms. And it's changing some, but it's not changing as much as we would like it to. Uh, and so the moms get burdened by that. And what you also add to moms, when you talk about maternal depression, the moms also suffer because they resent it deeply. Mm -hmm. They resent the fact that the dads are not helping. And they also resent once the fact, once their kids get older and big bodied, you know, wait a minute, he's a 16 year old boy. Can, can he dust? Can he vacuum? Can he clean a bathroom? Well, he doesn't seem to be doing it. That's irritating. Uh, and so you get and one of the rules in psychology is if you have something that irritates you on a regular basis and you can't or won't do anything about it, it's going to make you depressed. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what we have with the 
the family dynamics here that we're talking about. Yes, I, I do. I do find that uh, so many mothers do feel like, and, and this book highlights that the fact that they feel like everything's on their shoulders, especially yeah. mothers of tweens and teens. Like you, you just, you just highlighted something that this age group where the, the teens and the, t the tweens and the teens, where they are at a different level of functioning and why are they not contributing to the house and why is it still on my shoulders? So there's a lot of that resentment that's building and then, and then that relational piece is being sacrificed, right? And then, yep. yes. And you know, interesting, if you <clears throat> talk about the tweens and the teens, if you look at uh, executive functioning skills, and I'm just gonna define executive functioning as the ability to start and complete a semi-boring task, like mm -hmm. homework or like cooking a meal or something like that. At age six, we have executive functioning sustenance at about 10 minutes age seven, 20 minutes, age nine, 40 minutes. And imagine then what it would be for a 12 year old or a 16 year old. It's not gonna be a lot greater than 40, but it's gonna be more adult-like. If you have a nine year old, a boy or a girl, <clears throat> and they can sustain a task for 40 minutes, can they cook a four course meal for a family of four and clean up the kitchen afterwards? The answer is yes. Why don't we have them do it? We don't have them do it but we could have them do it. And I can tell you if it's done in the right way, they would like doing it because kids want to do what the big people are doing and kids want to contribute to their group just like anybody else does. And we don't know how to let them do that. I am so appreciative that you brought this up. There was an example given of unloading a dishwasher and um, sometimes I use it a lot with parents, right? We often want the dishwasher unloaded the way that we want to. But <clears throat> we have to start letting, like I literally have to take a deep breath before I even even go there. But, but we have started the process. You have to train yourself to have that modality. And many of us talk about control. We all have different varying levels of control as a parent that we have somehow taken ourselves. So I, there is a need to start to release so that we let them do it the way that they were designed, which is very different from us sometimes. Yeah, you got it. You got it. That's, a, that's an excellent point because the, uh, you hear from so many teenagers something like, my mom always tells me, she wants me to do my own laundry. I do my own laundry and she tells me I'm not doing it right. Mm -hmm. And so there's an art. And then, you know, in fairness to the moms, the moms aren't trying to be a witch in, 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 in you know, getting after somebody, but there's a real art in letting go. It's very tough. And I think that's what you were just saying. If mom's gonna let go, you're gonna have to allow people, dad and kids, yes. to do it their way. And you're gonna have to recognize the fact that they have the skill and there's a lot of stories, uh, interesting stories about dads and kids doing things different from how mom, and, and if mom takes a deep breath, shuts up, doesn't correct, the, the, the stuff will get out of her hands and, it's, and she'll feel much more relieved. Dr. Phil, it's 100% as, as, as the release starts to happen of control, gradual release of control, there's a whole phenomenon behind it, but as we start to do it, it does become easier, just like you're talking about. It becomes easier when you learn a, a simple system such as one, two, three magic, how to start to do it, how to implement. But it takes, I think it just takes the recognition that once, 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 and I, as a mother, I'm saying, once we start the snowball, our own home environment will start to really, I think, if you are, if you have someone who is co-parenting with you in the house, if you have children, multiple children, single, one child, you will see the effect of a happier household, I feel, because I have worked very hard on gradual release of control of myself in my own home, and it's made a very big difference. Yeah, oh, that's good. And, you know, you mentioned something else, I think, that's a very important, that your dishwasher example, uh, <clears throat> a lot of parents will say, you know, all I did was ask him, my son, say, to empty the dishwasher and he blew up at me. Well, okay, part of the art of this is you don't do what we call spontaneous requests mm -hmm. or spur of the moment requests. Honey, do you have time to empty the dishwasher? And the kid gets mad. 
Well, it's normal to get mad at a spontaneous request. And so, but then the parent thinks, well, gee, the kid can't even do this. I'm doing everything around here. He can't even empty the stupid dishwasher and all that. That's not how you do it. That's not how you do total responsibility transfers. You do total responsibility transfers and you negotiate a way for that job to be that kid's. And if that dishwasher doesn't get emptied, it doesn't get emptied. And that's the way it is. But you can't do repeated spontaneous requests because there's another name for that and it's called nagging. It's mm-hmm. called prattling, it's called babbling, it's called chattering, and it's repulsive to other people in the family. It's no way, it's no way to transfer responsibility permanently. And, and thank you for saying that because most moms that I do say, I'm tired of nagging. Like they literally are feeling like the pressure of nag they feel like they're doing it, they feel like they're not getting heard. The recipients on the other end, then what? We're not, there's no reciprocity of what we're trying to look for. So really it's hell in a hand basket for that family because yeah, no right. one feels like it's it's functioning at that level that they would all like which again is sacrificing their relationship yeah and you know if it, if you want to uh, tell parents a place to start i always like to start there's a chapter in the book called can a seven-year-old do their own laundry and the answer is yes a seven-year-old can run your washing machine you think it's complex it's nothing you've seen what they can do to the on an ipad as your washing machine is nothing all seven-year-olds and kids over seven should be doing their own laundry you, you train them to do it and then they do it if they don't do it they don't have clean clothes and you try that for three months and see how it, how it comes out in the wash and then you graduate from that to their doing their own homework without mom or dad saying, do you have homework? You shouldn't be saying, do you have homework tonight for a 12 year old or a 10 year old? Mm -hmm. And then you graduate to guess what? You have the 10 year old cooking a four course meal for a family of four. You just highlighted the fact about brain development, which everything we have, we are so blessed with the amount of research that has occurred for this wonderful organ with the brain. You brought up executive functioning and how a 40 minute, how, actually 40 minutes to a task can be given. And I do love that you brought up laundry example. It's the biggest contention for moms all across. It's just so much of it, right? And 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 actually with my own children, like they are sure because they're, and I think we have to get vested into helping kids get earlier where they are sponges and they want to do. So that then that propels those teen, tweens and teenage years because we didn't help those ex- those reasonable expectations that are developmentally appropriate then can then spiral where the te- tweens and teens just know it's part of it's part of how it functions for them and they feel empowered versus feeling they're depowered actually right when we I think you're right I think you want to tap in the kids have the motivation to do what the big people are doing when mm-hmm. they're two, three, four, mm-hmm. five, and all that, <clears throat> and they, they want to do that stuff. And that's the time, as you were saying, I think, to get in there and, and help them get used to doing uh, these things. I think what we do, do is we, we don't respond to that because they tend to be messy and they tend to be sloppy. And so we put them on their iPad. And so now they've been on their iPad for six years. We come back when they're 10 years old and say, I want you to learn how to clean your own room. I want you to do how you, and they're thinking, wait a minute, I've been uh, having a good time with my iPad. Now you're bugging me about these stupid chores. Well, you didn't, you didn't lay the foundation uh, and so on. And I think it also applies to the dads, the the husbands, all you people listening, your husbands should be doing their own laundry. You shouldn't be doing their laundry, period. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Dr. Phil, you might get in trouble for that. I'm just kidding. I I love it. I do love, because there's some tasks that I think we need to take We need to take gender out of household tasks. You know, there is no his and her. They're tasks and they're chores. And we excel in some and we aren't we don't. You have to look at your skill set again. I often tell people who's who who is better in the who enjoys the cooking more. Then you you really have to go through and look at people's skill set. It is a job. I keep saying this is a job. You have to you have to know where people's strengths are, what are the weaknesses. And, you know, I have been doing this a lot about talking to everyone. Everyone loves sports, mainly that I know. Always use the team example in your house. Do you want to be a functional team? It's a team sport to have this house work the way. And so kids, especially teens and tweens, respond to team analogy. So I often tell families in those years, use the team analogy to make sure you can get that cohesion that you're looking for and responsiveness. Yeah, 
I think so. And let me give you one warning, a warning if we're talking to you know the moms here in particular. <clears throat> we guys are tricky. Uh, we weren't born yesterday. <clears throat> and so we are perfectly capable of faking incompetence with certain tasks in order not to have to do them. Uh, so if you say, I'm going to cook, I'm the dad now, and I'm going to cook a meal for a family of four, and I burn the hamburgers, and I overcook the peas, and I spill the applesauce, the, my message to you is, I'm no good at doing this. You can't expect me to do it. Uh, and so as, as the mom in that situation, you may respond, well, you know, for a first, child, a first try, this looks great. I can't wait to see what you're going to do next week or something like that. But uh, it can get to be a kind of a, uh, a somewhat intricate and tricky uh, interaction. Yes. Yes. I, I just, again, appreciate you bringing up the dynamic piece of how we can, we can making small little shifts about, first of all, to eliminate the word of right. And there's no right. I think that's the issue that you have to first do is get rid of the word right. There is no right way to download a dishwasher. I'm sorry I keep using that example today. It just looks different. Your way of doing it and my way are different. Right. And we may yep. have a conditioning as a, our own ch childhood does come into play of control power and control issues. And I always say that the generation that did raise mm -hmm. some of our Gen X's and our Gen Z's, they just had to keep going and they had to get things moving. But this generation and empowerment skills looks different. So we have to take advantage of doing it. Yeah. Yes. Can you share some more of your, because it's not just one, two, three magic that you've done for children. Can you, I, um, I know there's teens and tweens are a whole category in themselves. So how do you share some of the skill set with that age group and those parents? I know you have a whole different program and a book for them as well, but what are some highlights? Well, I think I'll just try and highlight two, two differences between the teens and the little kids. And that means two differences between one, two, three magic and the book we call one, two, three magic teen. One difference is, uh, I'll give you uh, an example. So that you're a parent of a teen now and you've got a 16 year old son, you're sitting down to dinner uh, at night and you wanna get a conversation going with your son. So you say, how was your day? And the boy says, fine. You say, what did you do? He says, nothing. Well, you're not gonna give up that easily. So you say, did you have social studies? And he says, yes. You say, what did you do in social studies? He says, we didn't do nothing in social studies. Okay. This is a scene that goes on in approximately 25 million American homes every night. It's called the adolescent snub. Uh, <clears throat> and what's going on here? What's going on is the teen is translating your question, how was your day? And he's taking it as, did you screw up anything today that I need to know about? Um, and he resents that. And so he does the snub, which is fine, nothing, fine, nothing. Mm -hmm. A lot of parents will tell you, I didn't intend the question that way. And that's true. Some parents don't. They are trying to start a conversation. There are other parents who do intend the question that way and who are seeing this teenager as a, you know, incomplete, imperfect, developing, growing human being uh, with whom I need to check regularly to make sure that his life or her life uh, is, is okay. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the snub is a function of industrialized societies where we have kids who, you know, in years ago, in three or 400 years ago, there probably wasn't adolescence. You grow up, you get to be a teenager, you get married, or, or you're, you're, you're working, you're doing something. We do an absolutely terrible job of giving our kids a chance at meaningful activities from the ages of 13 to about 22. In, the industrials, in, in industrialized societies, the reason for that is that they have to go to school to learn the skills that are required by industrialized societies. But while they're going to school, they are dependent on adults for their livelihood and so on. And they resent it. They don't like it. They're mm -hmm. thinking, I can do this. They, in a sense, they're almost thinking, I have the executive skills and the physical size that you have. How come I can't do these you know, other things? other things. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes a real problem. So I tell parents of teens, I say the first thing you have to, and 50% of the job of living with teenagers is not taking the snub personally, mm -hmm. by understanding it effectively. It's not directed at you. 
it's in a sense it's directed at our overall society but it also means that if if you're going to get the snub when you say how was your day don't ask that question <laughs> It's a bad question. It's a stupid question. It causes trouble. Don't do it. Mm -hmm. parents say, what am I supposed to do? And number one, say, don't say anything. Wait for them to talk. But a second option, and I did this with my son, who was very difficult to be with some of the time when he was a teenager, I would talk about myself. <clears throat> I remember one dinner, I, I told him about a, a fight I'd almost gotten into on the way home from work. And some guy was yelling at me because he thought I came too close to him in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And so this is about me. It's not about evaluating him about how he's doing in life. This is a mistake sort of that I made. And he was right there. He was in the conversation. He was involved. There was no question of a snub uh, or anything like that. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing goes along with this, uh, and I'm talking about difference between teen and one, two, three magic, uh, is that you are into um, letting go more than controlling behavior. Uh, and that means your teens have their MBAs, which are minor but aggravating <laughs> behaviors that can drive you crazy, uh, but that aren't assigned a mental illness or required discipline. Okay. And that could be language, it could be dress, it could be eating habits, it could be, uh, you know, a number of different things. Uh, but as a parent of a teen, you want to be letting go uh, and recognizing their independence. Uh, <clears throat> and you have to be. Uh, also willing to not take, you know, if they snub you, where are they going? Their interests now are peers. They're passionate about peers. They're not passionate about mom and they're not passionate about dad. Get used to it. That's the new game. Yeah, you just, again, you highlighted so many, so many great things about this particular age group. And I think a lot of it is we sometimes forget I always use the example that their brains are so that age, their brains and their bodies are so developmentally growing so quick and they're not as cute as they used to be, but there's so much happening with that age group. And that's what we have to remember to developmentally what's happening. It's a lot going on for them. And so I always try to tell parents, can you imagine growing? You remember the growth spurts that hit, hurt your child as a baby? They are having them exponentially. It was just, so sometimes we have to get in the mindset of what's happening to our children. And I love the fact that you talk about yourself because I think the number one thing we do with children is we don't expose them to our stories and everyone loves stories. Yeah, they do. And they children, do. I think we don't, we don't, we do a lot of this hierarchy and it, you, there it needs to be a, I always say there's needs to be a little bit of fear, a little bit of fear from your parent, but not enough where it's not a, a, a beautiful relationship where you interact and are faced. Um, and I think I say a little bit of fear because the discipline hat that you wear as a parent, you still need to, they still need to understand who's in charge. Yeah. No, if you, I think that's an excellent point. If you, you think I want to talk to my kids about drugs or sex or whatever. Okay. What was your experience as a parent? Are you willing to talk about that? Or do you, you know, everybody's embarrassed talking about drugs and sex, their own personal experience with it. So you expect them to talk about it and embarrass themselves and you're not going to join the club. That's not fair. Totally. Totally. Thank you for bringing that up about authenticity as a parent. It's a huge, huge thing. Dr. Phelan, how do, how do, um, how, where can everyone get access to your books and to your program? And um, I do want to remind the audience that just reading the book in itself and practicing, this is, it's so effective. So it's so easy, but where do, uh, where do people find your materials and, and access to you? Yeah, they're pretty much all over. I mean, our website is 123magic.com. <clears throat> and um, our uh, email address is kind of long, <clears throat> but there it is. <laughs> uh, so uh, you can memorize that quickly. But once you do magic.com, we'll get you there. And also, the, you know, the books are in almost all the bookstores. Um, and there are still a few physical bookstores, and they're in those, like Barnes and Noble. And of course, they're on uh, Amazon, uh, easy to find on Amazon. Great. Dr. Phelan, thank you so much for the gift of your time. I really, this. I just think this is such a helpful, powerful conversation about the simplicity behind parenting. If we can do some gradual release of control, especially I'm, I'm saying mom because I am a mom, just a little bit of release to see this shift that happens. I think I gather that from today for myself, too. It's a good cause. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks, our team. Everyone, thanks for tuning in to another episode. As always, keep it simple and take care.